Shalom, everyone, and welcome to another Thursday night Isaiah study. And so we're looking at Isaiah chapter 13, verses 1 through 11. And this is half of chapter 13. And we I titled the study for this week, Isaiah Starts Talking About Babylon. Okay, and so I'm looking at the, the various commentaries. It, it's interesting I mean, because the Christian commentaries have a major problem with the shift in the narrative that as we get into chapter 13 of Isaiah here. You know, Isaiah starts talking about Babylon, and, and the reason being is that the relationship between these chapters is not quite clear. In addition to Babylon only becoming a conquering nation a hundred years following Isaiah and after Isaiah. So this difficulty, I feel, personally, I feel that this is rooted in a lack of faith. You know, not believing that God can provide a prophetic word of the destruction of nations prior to this happening. You know, many commentaries simply state that these chapters were put together by different redactors and could not have been written by Isaiah because they're so accurate, right? And, and as we continue reading through chapters 13 to 39. And we remember in the introduction to Isaiah, we, we talked about how Isaiah is divided in the, uh, what you, say, you could say that the research literature or the, um, the commentaries in the sense that from 1 to 39 and then 40 and on, like they, they believe in generally that there were two authors. Okay, two authors. Isaiah didn't author the entire text, you know, from all the way up to chapter 66. But um, when, as we continue through chapter 13 to 39, Isaiah maintains his theme that he is established in Isaiah 1 through 7, and that is to trust in the Lord and not in men. And we note, again, that trusting in the Lord God in heaven leads to life, right? Whereas trusting in man leads to destruction. You know, so now John Oswald in his commentary, he states that the God of Israel is the Lord of the nations and the fate of the nations is in his hands. He is the sovereign actor on the stage of history and not they. Trusting the nations instead of the king is foolishness. And the ultimate conclusion is if one trusts in the nations, this leads to a desert waste. Whereas trusting in God leads to Gan Eden, right? The Garden of Eden or paradise. Okay, so... Uh, John Oswald's opinion, you know, his point is that this this theme ties these chapters together, okay, that of trusting in God, right, chapters 13 to 39, and making them into a compositional whole that Isaiah wrote, you know, he wrote this, and we believe it, right, and so when we consider the text from this context of, of trusting in God, that uh, together, chapters 13 and 39 are well structured, right? And there are four major sections in these, in chapter 13 and 14, when we look at these as a compositional whole. In chapters 13, verses 1 to 18, it describes God's destruction of human pride. In chapter 13, verses 19 to 22, it describes the destruction of Babylon. In chapter 14, verses 1 to 23, it describes the downfall of the king of Babylon. And then in verses 24 to 27, it describes the Lord's plan for Assyria. Okay, so in chapter 13, it opens in with the first verse. And it says, Masa Babel, Asher Chaza Yeshayahu ben Amutz, meaning that... Um, let me, when I underlined, I, I wrote over other words. Okay, so th this means that the burden of Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amotz, saw, right? His vision, this vision, um, this chaza. And then this statement, what would this one sentence, you know, the opening verse, it, it it provides for us the context that God is able to show his prophet the things which are to come, right? That we can trust his words, right? And the Lord God is able to reveal events before they come to pass. And some examples that we, we get is in Isaiah 14 or, or chapter 41 or 44 and 45. You know, something to consider in regard to those who lack faith in God's ability to provide 
the course of future events. You know, so the idea is that throughout the Bible we learn about who God is, that he is a moral God who speaks truth. And this means that when we read the scriptures, we can believe them because they speak truth, right? And they are an accurate record of history and of God working in the lives of his people. And we can believe and have faith that when we seek him and his Messiah, Yeshua, that we can have the God of Israel working in our lives too, just as we see God working in the lives of, of, of Israel, right? And in the very same way, you know, they, that he worked in the lives that, that took place in the scriptures, he can, we can have that today, right? And so in verse 13, verse 1, Isaiah speaks of the truth of what is going to happen to Babylon. He says, I, he, it's this, this vision that is given to him of God, from God, right? And so if, if we are to believe that these words are manipulated, meaning that there was some kind of falsehood that is being used to prove a truth, okay? And, and that, that, I believe, is what these commentaries who, who doubt the authorship of Isaiah, you know, they, they say there had to be other redactors. So this, this is the idea that the words of the text are, have been manipulated, that there is a falsehood here, right? And that and it's trying to prove a truth. You know, we, um, this is this. I believe this is patently contradictory to the character and trust truthfulness of God and the scriptures that we trust, right? And considering also, I I, I thought this was an interesting point that we can if we consider the scribal tradition, right? The meticulous methods in which the scriptures were preserved, the men involved. Preserving the scriptures were not about the business of inserting their own interpretation of what Isaiah was saying. You know that that would become a targum, and you know, we have those, right? But um, and that that the, the 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 scribes were not in the business of modifying or changing the text. You know, they the the example that we have in the Masoretic text is the Keri Ketiv. You know, the the, the Aramaic Keri means what is read, and Ketiv what is written, and so. These were orthographic devices that were used by the Masoretes, the Jewish scribes from the 6th to the 10th centuries. And in these locations where the, we find this Keri Ketiv, the text is written in one way, yet the text is to be read a different way. And, and the notes are made in the marginal Mazora to indicate how it's to be read. So the idea was that uh, the scribes were so meticulous in preserving the original writing of the text that even if there were errors in the text and how it was to be read. They preserved these errors and simply made a note at the bottom of the page or along the side, you know, if you look at, at uh, like the Leningrad Codex. And so uh, they, they preserved, their, their role was to preserve the text no, no matter what. And the, the significance of this is related to this truth claim that we find here in Isaiah that the scriptures are not leading us to believe a falsehood. And, and so if, if we believe that the text has been modified to, by different redactors, you know, and compiled together and, and, you know, whatnot, as opposed to Isaiah writing the entire text, this, this is the idea of uh, believing in a falsehood, I, I feel, that if the text was modified to use a falsehood to prove truth, this stands in the face of everything that God and his word represents, right? And it poses a very serious problem. And so, um, in addition, Isaiah did not necessarily have to have a complete picture given by God of Nebuchadnezzar and all of the events that take place in, to Israel, right? But he simply needed a generalized understanding that in their pride they would fall as well, similar to the way that Assyria is behaving. And in the end, the reason why Israel is being attacked, right? God, why God is bringing these vessels of wrath, right? We'll talk about that. In some commentaries, they, however, they force their opinion into the book of Isaiah, believing that Isaiah needed to have all of the details in order to be proven as a true prophet of God. And so the, the idea that there were different redactors, because this, what we read here in chapter 13 and chapter 14, because there isn't exact details he couldn't have written it right that that's that's the claim of some and so uh, i feel this is in error right and predictive prophecy does not necessarily have to contain in quotes all 
of the explicit details. And, and this is what we see in Isaiah's prophetic word as we continue to study this book. Okay, and so next verses we're looking at is verse 2 and 3 in chapter 13 of Isaiah. And it says, it says the following... Okay, it says, Alhar Nishpet Seunes, okay, and it, that is lift up the banner upon the high mountain, and then Harimu, you know, exalt the voice, the coal, their voice, and then Hanifu Yad, you know, shake the hand, and Vayavu, Yavo Pithe Nadivim. And it means that they may go into the gates of the nobles. And then in verse 3, it says, Ani mitzveti lim kudasha. And that is, I have commanded my sanctified ones. Okay. And then, Gam karati giborai la'af. Api Alize Gavati, meaning that I have also called my mighty ones for my anger, even them that rejoice in my uh, my greatness. Okay, so this this these these verses they remind us of the Torah perspective, right? And from Parashat Beshalach is what I'm reminded of, and that's from Exodus chapter thirteen to seventeen, and how Moshe's body grew tired, and in the main. The main thing is this, this lifting up a banner, right? This lifting up a banner. And that when he held his arms up, he began um, to fail. And when his armies, when his arms fail, I said, okay, let me rephrase that. When Moses held his arms up, he, um, Israel prevailed. And when his arms fell, Israel started to lose the battle. And so, um, that that's what we that's one of the stories in Parashat Beshalach, and only with Moses' arms raised did Israel win the battle. And we read that Aaron and Hur, who were stood on stood on either side and held up his hands until the battle was won. And as a result of this victory, Moshe built an altar called Adonai Nisi, meaning that the Lord is my banner. And here. God is calling out to the nation of Babylon to raise rise up the raise up the banner and which is a call to arms from a Torah perspective. You know, that that's my opinion, I think, is a call to arms from a Torah perspective. The point is is that God is going to use the proud to cast down the proud, right? And so the the statement where it says, I have commanded my sanctified ones right here. I have commanded my sanctified ones. Uh, so it, I thought this was, seemed a little strange, you know, as this may refer to men who are being, or who are making ready for battle, to do so via purification. They keep themselves pure and holy unto God. And the why I think of this is it comes from First Samuel chapter twenty-one. What David and his men do, what they did, right? They they would uh, they kept themselves from women and they would they would sanctify they would set themselves apart unto God when before going into battle and what we find here is that um, the word the root word shirash means um, the meaning the root shirash okay um, meaning uh, kadosh it, it means to be set apart so this may be speaking of God as calling this nation and and this nation, singling this nation out as setting her apart to uh, bring judgment against Judah and Jerusalem. You know, it's interesting how the Lord speaks of Babylon as a, um, that I have called out my mighty ones, you know, Karati Gibor, um, Giborai, right? He's called out his, his powerful ones, and even then that rejoice in his highness, his greatness. And, and the conclusion may be related to the words that were spoken to the men of Jerusalem when they were surrounded, that the God of Israel had sent them. And I, this reminded me because when in, I, I'm trying to think, it's, it's Jeremiah where the men speak out to all of those who are sitting on the wall 
And then uh, they said, don't speak to us in Hebrew, speak to us in, in Aramaic. And they go, no, we're going to speak to you in Hebrew because uh, the people should know. And um, the, one of the guys speaking, now I, I think it was at this time, maybe you know, I could be wrong, but uh, this is where the, they spoke and they said that your God has sent us, right? And so they, they knew, they knew the prophecies, they knew what was going on in with Jeremiah's prophecies and, and maybe here with Isaiah, what Isaiah had been saying, you know, a hundred years previous, right? And so uh, we see here again, and we're looking at verses four through five. Okay. So it says the uh, the Ko Hamon Beharim that the the noise of the multitude in the mountains, Demut uh, Amra, that they are like as a, a great people. In Kol Sheon Mam Lechot Goyim Neesafim, and it means a, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. And then Adonai Tsevaot, the Lord of hosts, Mepak. Mepaked Tseva Milchama, meaning that the Lord God of hosts, he looked at her, he inspected the hosts of the um, the warriors, the battle, right, the, the, the warriors. And, and then it goes on, and it says, Baim Ma'aretz Merchak Mikse Hashamayim, and it is that they come from a far country, from the end of of heaven, right? In Adonai Uchle Zamo Lechabel Koha Aretz, and that uh, even the Lord and the weapons of his his anger to destroy all of the land. Okay, so this directly speaks to the Lord gathering the nation, you know, bringing them to Judah and Jerusalem. We know in Isaiah 3 5. How um, that it does not matter that the distance of the nation is from Israel, the Lord will call them from anywhere on the surface of the earth, and and we we see this right here, and it says um, bringing bringing from the far regions of the earth, from the ends of the heavens, right? And so uh, the idea here is that the Lord will bring whom He chooses to bring. To bring judgment right upon those who are unrepentant, who, are, who um, do not seek the Lord God Almighty, and so this great army that is being described here has come for one purpose, and that is the destruction of Judah and Jerusalem because of her unrepentant sin. We note the emphasis in these verses upon the army of God that is putting that is being put together. To destroy the whole land, right? And we note the word um, vessels of wrath. Where is that? Um, oh yeah, yeah. Uchle zamo, right? And the vessels of wrath. And this reminded me of Romans nine twenty two, right? And something Paul wrote here. Romans nine twenty two. So uh, I got the the peshita, and you can you see this word. Um, Rugze, rugze, right? We also see the word rugze. That means wrath. And um, I highlighted, I highlighted the word. Um, let me change color here on the the pen. Yeah, rugze. And um, then here, rugze all mane, right? And that is, that is um, wrath upon the vessels, okay, or vessels of wrath. And so the idea, and in Romans nine twenty two, is that what if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. And so the idea here is that these these men were created to bring destruction to those who were unrepentant, right? And and did not uh, desire to live their lives for the Lord, right? They, they chose to turn away from him and his word. They chose not to listen to his holy word, right? And the, uh, in the Peshitta, the, that wrath upon the vessels, 
um, that does that speaks to that God created men for destruction. They bring bring them from the farthest regions of the earth to be His instruments to bring destruction that is promised according to the Torah, right? For those who refuse to seek the Lord and to listen to His voice, right? So in in this context from Isaiah, the Lord is coming along with His army, His vessels of wrath, to demonstrate that we need to have faith in Him, in the Lord God in heaven, and not in this world or its pleasures and wealth. You know How foolish it is to trust in this world as opposed to the Lord God Almighty in heaven. Now, the next verse we're looking at is verse 7 and 8. Yeah, 7 and 8. Oh, no, sorry. Verse 6. I missed that. Okay, so in verse 6 it says, Hallelujah. It says, How? Ki kar, um, karov yom Adonai um, keshod mishadai yavo. Okay, so this is how for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. Okay, and it's interesting is that we got the same root words here, the shin dalet, and uh, for Keshod and um, Mishadai, you know, from the Almighty, right? El Shaddai, remember the Lord Almighty, the All-Sufficient One. Um, the word, now here in the beginning, the word Halilu, it means to howl, to, to lament, right? And it's a he feel verb meaning to wail or lament, yeah, meaning that you shall, you are, you will lament, lament, right? And this is a description of terror, as the day of the Lord draws near, right? And this day of terror means that all of men's strength will fail. Even the creation itself will shake at the deepest foundations of the, as the wrath of God is being poured out upon this nation. And this is similar to the other prophetic books in the Tanakh that speak of, an, of the all-powerful God who is Lord over all and the pride of men who presupposes to have this prince pre, um, supremacy himself, right? And the examples are in uh, Isaiah, again, and in Amos chapter 5, and Micah 5, and Zephaniah, and, and Malachi, and so forth, right? And Isaiah says that, um, he says that, uh, Kedosh Mishadaya Vo, the destruction from the Almighty will come, you know, and, and it says that um, it's right here. Let's just circle it a little bit. And then, um, so he says that that the same, okay, I already talked about this, the same root word used here twice. <laughs> Once to describe destruction, the second to describe the Almighty God, the All-Sufficient One, right? That, that uh, if we choose to not listen to the Lord, if we choose to ignore Him, right? If we choose to ignore God's Word, that uh, there's destruction waiting, right? And why would we choose a, a, to ignore a loving God, right? Why, why would anyone choose to ignore a loving God, right? Now, that's a, I think that's a fantastic question. Now, uh, verse 7 and 8, we read uh, the following, and it says, it says, uh, okay, right here. Okay, it says all all can call yadayim tirpena, meaning that um, therefore shall all hands be faint. Okay, and says so we were talking about that all the, when the earth shakes, the, the you know, and men's strength will fail, right? When God attacks, and and then or, I mean when these armies attack, I mean, and then it says the kol levav enosh yimes, meaning that uh, that every man's heart will melt, and then. In verse 8, it goes on and it says, Vaniv halu tsirim vechavilim yohezun. And it means that they shall, have, shall be afraid, pains and sorrows shall take hold of them. And koyoleda yehilun, meaning that a woman shall be. In travail, and Ish the man El Rehu unto his neighbor, Yit Mehu Pene Lechavim Penehem, meaning that um, one 
she'll be amazed at another, right? And their faces shall be as, as uh, flames. Okay, so something to note about what the Torah states concerning these things according to Parashat Kitabo. So th- this, these two verses reminded me of Parashat Kitabo. And so that is from Deuteronomy 28, verses, verse 15. And so it says that it and it will it will come to pass that if you will not listen to the voice of the Lord your God, right? And th- this is a, that's a significant statement because you know we have God's written word. These are the words of God. We are to listen to them, right? And it says um, lish more la asot to keep them and to do to observe them. Um, to keep and to do all of his mitzvotav and all, all of his commandments, all of his hukav, all of his um, statutes that I am commanding you today, and the in all these these um, all of these curses will come upon you and overtake you, right? And so the scripture pri- provided us according to Isaiah is that. Therefore, shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. And this is this is exactly what happens to those who do not listen to the voice of the Lord. Who um, lo tishma the kol Adonai Elohecha, right? The Lord your God. And so, when when people don't, when men don't. And women and children, and, you know, when when people don't listen to Hashem, they don't listen to His voice. And the point is that those who choose to not listen, this is what Isaiah was talking about in all of these chapters. You know, the people's lack of trust in the Lord has led to their current predicament. And so, the these Torah-based truths remain valid for us today if we are unwilling to listen to the voice of God. Right. And here Isaiah describes how men will become weak. Right. And he says that they will uh, they will be afraid and pains and sorrows will take hold of them, right? Okay. So uh, the next verses, and then, and then okay, let on. Let me see here. Yeah, they'll take hold of them, and this this is the outcome of turning one's back on the Lord. You know, on the other hand. The blessing of God comes to those who listen to the voice of God and obey. You know, when these things these things are true even today, right? In Yeshua, right? And now the next reference is from Deuteronomy chapter twenty eight, verse one through two, reminding me of. And it says that it that it will the Haya, it will come to pass that if you listen to the voice of the Lord your God, right? And that that listening means that you do something right that that you will keep or that you will keep and do all of his mitzvotav all, all of his commandments that and Moshe says that I am commanding you today and the Lord will set on high he will give you right he'll give you um, upon he will give you all the blessings of the earth, right, and um, the nations of the earth, and that all these blessings will come, right, and that they will overtake you if you listen to the voice of the Lord, right, if you listen to the voice of the Lord your God. So I, I like this, the the his ge'ucha, right, they will overtake you, Right, that that's um, that is a, a fantastic thing. That they it will like take and it will seize hold of you, right? And then this is this is what happens when we believe in the Lord and when we we choose to to obey and to listen and to um, you know when we have faith in Yeshua and our Father sends His Holy Spirit into our lives, right, and, and dwells in our hearts that. We have this desire to live for him, to to walk according to his words, his holy words. And this is what this is speaking of here, in the sense that we will listen. You know, and, and it, it is also it's 
there's a calling of the Spirit, right, that, that calls us. And we have to also humble ourselves to be willing to listen. You know, and it's not just a, a one-sided thing, right? You know, God is calling and, and we are to respond. And we note that what the Lord is doing here is that is he is fulfilling his word according to the Torah, right? That uh, when man turns his back upon the Lord, all of the pride and haughtiness will become, will be brought low. And the people will be given a fear that that uh, will cause them to tremble and their weapons will fail and they will not be able to resist their enemies. And this is a Torah-based truth. You know, and Isaiah is speaking from the Torah that what is what will happen, right? And uh, remember, according to 1 Corinthians 10, you know, Paul wrote that, these things were all written for our instruction. You know, so therefore, all of these things should cause us to pause and ask ourselves, in whom do I trust, right? Do I tr trust in myself or do I trust in the Lord? And the answer should be that I trust in the Lord. And the, uh, this is the very thing that takes place by our faith in Yeshua the Messiah, right? You know, we are clothed in the righteousness of God when we stand before his throne. And, and that while we are here on earth, we seek that righteousness. We seek the righteousness of God, and we do so according to his word. Now, verse 9, it states the following. It says, Hine yom Adonai, right? The, Behold, the day of the Lord, right? It, 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 ba, it, it comes. And... It says, Achzeri, the Avra, the Haron, off uh, Lashum Haaretz. And meaning the, the cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. And Lashama, the Hataeha, Yashmid Mimena, meaning that, uh, and he shall destroy the sinners, right? Uh, and therefore, or thereof out of it. And so here, the Lord is using a foreign nation to bring judgment on Israel. Again, right? Isaiah is teaching us that when a person chooses to do things on his own, independent of the Lord, disaster is at hand, right? And sin is to miss the mark or the goal that the Lord God wants for us. And this is why he gives us his word and why he calls out to us, right? Because to, so he wants a relationship with us. He wants to enter into our lives and dwell in our midst. This is a, this is a Torah-centric principle. Now, verses 10 and 11. Finally, in, in the last verses we'll be looking at, verses 10 and 11, uh, they say the following, and it, it, it says, Ki... Chovei Hashemayim, you know, that the stars of heaven, Uchsilehem lo yachalu oram chashev, that uh, the, the stars of heaven and the constellations therefore shall not um, give their light. You know, it's interesting, this is the word for Orion. So it's not just constellations, it's specifying a particular constellation, Orion. And then it says that the uh, the Hashech Hashemesh, that the sun will become dark, Em Betzeto Veyareach Lo Yagiach Oro. And it means the sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And then, in verse uh, 11, it says, Ufkadti al tevel ra'a the al reshayim um, aonam, meaning that I will punish the world for their evil and wicked for their iniquity. In the Hishbati Geon Zedim, the Gavat Aritzim Ashpil, and that I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. So, there's something to note 
is that the nations worship the stars in heaven. I, I that, that this, is, this is what come to mind here. The idea of the stars of heaven ceasing to show their light may be a way of saying how the Lord was was defeating their gods in whom they worship or whom they, the nations trust, right? And so these things describe how the day of the Lord will be darkness and there will be no other gods. Okay, and then it just seemed to make sense, right? And so the heavenly bodies which simply reflect the glory of God who are worshipped will cease. And so these nations which are already in darkness due to their sins will be plunged into utter darkness. And note how evil always needs darkness to hide their sin, right? And sinners love the darkness. They commit their sins in the dark. And remember that God is light, right? And sin does not like the light. And light equals righteousness. It's an analogy for righteousness. And so the nations, such as the Greeks, they made their gods in their image, in the image of man, and which is due to their pride. Pride is setting oneself up in a position of glory in one's heart. And it's in this behavior that leads to one taking advantage of others, which is in defiance of the Lord God's plan for our lives. You know, sin always leads to more sin. In sowing to the flesh, one reaps from the flesh. And this is the fundamental concept that is laid out both in the Torah and in the New Testament text. So this truth is what we read according to Leviticus 26, verse 17. It says, I will set my face against you, and you shall be struck down before your enemies. Those who hate you shall rule over you, and you shall flee with when no, none pursue you. Okay, and, and in Deuteronomy 28, verse 25, the Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. He will come at them from one direction, but flee from them in seven and you will come. You will become a, a thing of horror to all the kingdoms of the earth, all because the people turn their backs upon the Lord and refuse to listen to His voice. Right? Teshuva, repentance, means to turn, to be awakened from the slumbering soul. Right? And Mammonites, he writes, he says that there is a hidden message that we're supposed to infer by listening to the shofar. It suggests to stay, to say. Sleeping ones, awake from your sleep. Slumbering ones, awake from your slumber. Examine your deeds and remember your Creator and perform Teshuvah. That was Mammonites. Okay, a similar statement is made by Paul in the book of Ephesians according to Ephesians 5 verses 13 to 14. It says, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible and everything that is illuminated becomes a, a light. And this is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So we notice this idea of the Messiah shining upon his people. And this is the righteousness of God that is given to, uh, given to the Messiah through whom we are atoned and delivered and redeemed. We note the, the light and dark themes here and the call to awaken from sleep. The Lord is calling us just as he is calling the people in Isaiah's time to repent and to turn from the ways, um, turn from their ways and return to the ways of the Lord to seek his face and to find joy in his salvation, in his rest, in his peace. And we note that uh, these concepts from Isaiah 13.10 are mentioned in, now I guess this, is, this may be a side note, these concepts are mentioned in Matthew 24, 29, verse 29, and Mark 13, verse 24. And it says that immediately after the tribulation of those days, that uh, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And and that was Matthew 24. And in Mark 13, it says, But in those days, um, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Okay, so we note the, the context, you know, following this event, the, the sun and moon and the stars, right? And there will be the return of the Messiah at the right hand of the power, at the right hand of God, right? And the reason being that um, these these things are worshipped by the nations as gods, or they ascribe gods to these things, to the stars and to the sun and to the moon, right? We think of Baal and Ashtoreth, right? And 
uh, that these things are where men have gathered their hope, right, as opposed to the hope in the God of Israel, the God, our creator, right? And so these these things that with the sun and moon and these things going dark, and these, these all speak to the great and mighty day of the Lord. You know, Isaiah and Matthew and Mark, in each of these books we note, how the presence of God causes the lesser lights to become extinguished. And this again causes us to come to the same conclusion that all pride and everything that sets itself up against the Lord will be humbled and brought low on that great day. And Revelation describes this as both heaven and earth fled from God's presence, right? In Revelation 20, verse 11, the point, and that on that great day, right? A great judgment day. And the point is that we are being called to seek the face of God, to humble ourselves, and to listen to the voice of the Holy One of Israel, right? And this is, this is coming from a loving God. He is giving us the time to repent. And so we should take that time to repent, right? 